Hello and welcome back to The Driven Wheel. In the 1960s, Triumph had a problem. Their venerable twin-cylinder engines were reaching the limit. Vibration was an issue as soon as the 500 became the 650, and so instead they decided to manufacture a 750 triple. The Triumph Triton and BSA Rocket 3 that resulted could have been game changers. Instead, internal politics and money issues meant their gestation period was nearly a decade. Regardless, the bike that resulted was brilliant in its own way, and the engine was used to great success in racing. Now this is a brief and potted history of the bike's inception, and what it's like to ride one today. Now before we start, it's important to understand why these bikes were needed. Triumph Twins, and most British Twins of the period, have what's called a 360 degree crank. This means that both pistons travel up and down together. Now the advantage here is simplicity of manufacture, but as piston weight or speed is increased, so is vibration. Now on small twins this is manageable, but 650s and 750s can shake a rider's hands and feet white at 80 miles an hour. Now this style of twin is inherently unbalanced, and as such has quite a low rev limit, and therefore it's got limited ability to make power. Now these problems were well recognised and understood in period, and building a triple would solve all of them, or so the logic went. Now the idea to create a triple was a good one when it was hatched in 1961. Unfortunately, it took nearly five years to assemble a running prototype, and a further three before bikes were delivered to customers. Now if it had come out in 1966 when it was supposed to, in a world where a powerful bike had 40 brake horsepower, it would have been revolutionary. By the time it was released, however, the Honda CB750 was about to come to market, and these had electric start, didn't leak oil, and made slightly more power than the Trident. True, they were underbraked and fairly poor handling, but they would start every morning. Now the T150 was first released in 1968 with a four-speed gearbox and about 60 brake horsepower. This gave it a top speed of about 120 miles an hour, which was seriously quick at the time. Drum brakes were fitted front and back, giving adequate stopping power. Now the bikes were not styled in-house, instead this job was given to Ogle, who among other things are famous for designing the Reliant Robin. Now personally, I really like the styling of these early bikes with their bread bin tanks and ray gun silencers. They've aged well and are fresh today, but were perhaps just too forward leaning at the time. It's fair to say the styling wasn't well received, and many dealers retrofitted traditional pear drop fuel tanks for their more conservative buyers. Now the bike we have here today is from 1973 and it's called the T150V. Now this is my bike and I've done thousands of miles on it and rebuilt it when it became necessary. I love the thing, but what I'm trying to do here is be objective about what works and what doesn't. It's got a 5 speed gearbox and a Lockheed front disc brake which was a small improvement over the drum in the dry. In wet weather, however, it was a bit of a different story, as Triumph decided to chrome plate the discs. This looked great, but asbestos pads and chrome discs led to shocking brake performance in the wet. Owners frequently have the chrome skimmed away to improve them, but with old pads they can still be pretty marginal today, requiring a serious pull to stop rapidly. Now on this one, the braking is surprisingly good, because I fitted sintered pads, which have two benefits. The first being they bite much harder, offering more feel than standard pads, and the second is that they strip away any chrome which might remain on the disc, making them decent in the wet. Now this one's also got braided lines which I rate on any motorbike, but particularly on old ones where you don't know the age of the rubber hoses. The only problem with improved brakes is the forks easily bottom out during moderate to hard braking, which leaves only the flex in the sidewall of the tyre to absorb bumps. Now this is fine, but it does mean it doesn't respond very well to trail braking, if that's your thing. The Triumph Triple is a vertically split case design, which for economy's sake could be produced using existing factory tooling. The added complexity of this engine, however, meant it had no fewer than seven casings. And the more casings you have, the more opportunity for oil leaks, with the top end being especially prone. Now it is possible to assemble them to be oil tight, but I've rarely seen a completely dry engine on one of these. 
Although the engineering is relatively straightforward, the fiddliness of assembling the head and rocker gear takes some beating, requiring a minimum of three hands or a good deal of luck. The clutch, unlike most of the period, runs dry instead of in an oil bath. Now, dry clutches are fine, but this one is tricky to adjust correctly and just doesn't offer the smoothness of a wet clutch. The three carburettors are supposed to be balanced using feeler gauges, but I found this to be inaccurate and it causes poor low speed running. Getting a vacuum gauge in is difficult because of how tight the carbs are to the frame, but trust me, it's worth it for the improved running. As you can see, there are negatives to these bikes, but there are most definitely positives too. So what's it like to ride? Well, first of all, you have to start it. From cold, stick the right-hand petrol tap on, and then choke, and tickle all three of the carburettors. It is possible to get a finger into the middle one, but you need to mash your hand into an unpleasant shape to do so. I tend to turn it over about five times after this with the ignition off to make sure it draws fuel into the cylinders, and then it takes a pretty swift and hefty kick to start. But if it's set up correctly, it should go first or second try. Now when it's warm, I don't bother with the middle carb and just prime the outers. Sure, it only fires on two, but the middle quickly gets going with a rev. Now there are two petrol taps here, and the left is a reserve. Triumph reckon if you wanted to do really high speed running, then to open both, but one seems fine at road speeds. Now the gear change is light and positive, which is a total contrast to the clutch, which is both heavy and grabby. In town this makes for quite hard work, and like most old bikes, you need to find neutral while moving to avoid getting stuck holding the clutch at traffic lights. At low speeds, the handling is neutral, and its relatively lightweight makes it great for pottering. The brakes are more than up to the job, and the rear is pretty powerful, especially compared to modern stuff. Low seat height and low pegs make for an easy life here. The motorway work is perfectly plausible, but it quickly becomes tiresome. These do vibrate less than a twin, but they still vibrate. Couple this with a very thin seat, which is necessitated by the position of the ignition coils, and it makes for hard work. There's no weather protection either, so wind blast becomes an issue above 70, and the foot pegs might be chunky rubber, but they transmit plenty of vibes above 4000 revs. Stability, however, is excellent with none of the weaves which BMW boxers of the period were famous for. Twisty roads, smooth roundabouts and short straights are where this bike excels. 60 horsepower is a small amount of power in a world of silly superbikes, but it hustles the bike along in a truly meaningful way. This was a very quick bike back in the 70s and it's still fast today. Overtaking is easy, and the noise it makes above 5,000 revs is truly exceptional. I haven't ridden a better sounding bike. Pea shooter exhaust and a virtually open intake make for a cacophony unrivaled by anything else. This combined with the surge when it comes on cam makes for an exhilarating joy. Pops and bangs on the overrun are part of the fun, as are the spits of flame bursting out, visible to following motorists after dark. The slick gear change enables clutchless shifts, and the handling is fantastic for an old bike. Now, the mass of the front wheel and cast iron disc assembly means it takes a good heave of counter steering to get the bike to turn at high speeds. Once in the corner, however, it's settled and it's comfortable. Small bumps are no issue, but larger ones start to highlight the crudeness of the suspension. The forks are too soft for quick riding, and the rear shocks lack damping as standard. If you keep pushing, you can make it buck and weave, which sounds alarming, but it's more a case of the bike telling you that you've reached the limits of its suspension. Modern tyres and grip levels means it's very easy to ground out pegs or the centre stand when leaned over. This impacts confidence a bit if you want to push the bike hard on bumpy roads, but it's all part of the limitations of owning a 50-year-old machine. Now, I think a lot of the appeal of the Trident is that it's great to ride as standard, but there are multiple ways of improving it and making it your own if you wanted to. Modern rear shocks and a cartridge kit for the forks would see corner speeds rise significantly. If you raise the pegs and bin the centre stand, the frame and geometry is easily good enough to take this, feeling miles better than Japanese bikes of the same period which would weave around when cornering quickly. The engine can be tuned as well, they won many races in period, and they still win many classic races today. So to conclude then, well, it leaks oil, it can be difficult to start, 
The clutch is heavy and it's crap on fuel. Basic maintenance is easy, but the engines are tricky to put together well. None of this matters though, because it makes a staggeringly good noise, handles well, and every time you park it you're going to look back at it. Some bikes and some cars are more than the sum of their parts, and this is definitely one of them. On a warm, dry day, as the sun sets and the horizon tints orange, if you're riding one of these, you will be content. And what matters more than that? Thank you for listening to The Driven Wheel. I'll see you again soon.